Good afternoon all. You are welcome to the Bramberg of the Prestige Institute. Uh, this afternoon we are lucky to have one of my mentors, my friend, and uh, somebody I respect in the university, that um, I have the honor of introducing her for our presentation today. Uh, Glenda Bonafacio is an associate professor at the Department of Women and Gender Studies, an affiliate of the Prentice Institute for Global Population and Economy. She is the author of the name of the priorities, Filipino women, and transnational identity published by the UBC Press in November 2012, uh, 2013, and an editor of the Feminism and Migration, Cross-Cultural Engagement, published by Stringer in 2012, and Gender and Rural Migration, Realities, Conflicts, and Change, published by Ritledge in 2014. She is also co-editor of Gender, Religion, and Migration, Pathways of Integration, published by Lessington in 2010. Glenda migrated to Canada by the way of Australia 10 years ago, leaving behind over nine years of academic work at the University of the Philippines. Uh, part of our forthcoming work include immigration and the small city, Canadian experience and perspective with Julie Drolet. Second one in the dark, family rights and migrant domestic work with Maria Contos. <coughs> Third one, feminist, uh, feminism, migration and trans national practice in Canada. So you can see that she's a woman of many, many parts. Uh, I have the honor of welcoming Glenda. But before I call her to come up, we, I'm passing around this paper for those who have not registered their email with the Prentice Institute. So please, and they want to put down your email so that we can be communicating with you from time to time. Secondly, uh, there will be, tentatively, there will be a brand bag seminar scheduled for May 16th. So please mark it down. Oh, May 23rd. Mark it down on migration as well. So you will be informed of the detail. Thank you. Please help me welcome Glenda Tibe for the first. Thing. Thank you so much, Olu. Uh, I respect everyone, especially Olu, for giving a wonderful introduction. Um, okay. The talk today or is on youth, youth balls in Asia, gender migration and development. This is uh, part of a so this is a pre preliminary study or a sort of study on the intersections of these variables for the first time in the Asian region, particularly covering China, India, and the Philippines. For this uh, talk, I will be including only Philippines and India since uh, this is a collaborative project and my collaborators are basically outside of North America at this point. First, uh, like, you know, like receiving an Oscar for coming here, I would like to thank the Apprentice Institute for providing a seed grant for the project 2011-2013. So the project is on gender and the youth bulge in Asian populations, implications for migration and development. So my collaborators actually work on different parts of the project. Our Dr. Ronaldo Mendoza, he was a former uh, staff of, the, of UNICEF in the United States and uh, was recruited to serve now as the executive director of the Policy Institute of the Asian Institute of Management in the Philippines. This is a private um, management school for corporate, for corporate executives, middle management, level, and Veronica Caparas at that time, when we were doing the project, she was with the University of Alberta Faculty of Education. A year after we followed up with the project, she was also hired at the Asian Institute of Management in the Philippines. So I guess I am fortunate to say that if you have some questions, it will be put on hold until I get contact with them. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Professor Gladys Navarro from the St. Louis University in the Philippines also collaborated with regards to the pilot youth survey in the Philippines in Northern Luzon. And Dr. David Yap is a, is a statistician as well with the Asian Institute of Management. And uh, we graduate student, uh, simulator, ELO also provided some sort of research assistance. And of course, our wonderful admin assistant, Leanne, was actually uh, recognized for all her support at the time. Okay, so what is the, there's suspense. <laughs> okay, so what is the youth bulge? Okay, the youth bulge means a peak in the number of young people in the national population. So there would be a large proportion, about 50 to 29 years old, relative to the adult population, from 30 up to uh, over 30. Now, Wesley and Cho actually provide some sort of a defining feature of the youth bulge of uh, consisting a large number of adolescents and young adults born when fertility is high, followed by declining numbers of children born after fertility decline. So that is the youth bulge, okay? Over 70 developing countries experiencing imminent youth bulge in, in the world today. And over 50% of the youth labor force are found in Asia. Okay. So that's actually, if you look into the global uh, dynamics of this growth and population, you have the youth bulge in developing countries, over 50% of them, and if you try to relate that with uh, the Western countries, you have what we call a graying population. So in developing countries, you have a youth bulge, 70 countries of this, and in the developed Western countries, you have a graying uh, population, okay? <laughs> okay, how we define the youth? Okay, so it's kind of difficult to have a common standard idea of a youth because if you look into United Nations, UNICEF, the age range is about 15 to 24 years old. You go in India, for example, the government of India in 2002 youth um, policy is about 16 to 30 years old. However, if you go to other references in India, depending on the program, depending on the activity, the youth you know, ranges vary. So it's sometimes 15 to 35 years old for the Ministry of Youth Affairs in India. In the Philippines, since 19, 1994, Republic Act 8044, you have the Youth in Nation Building Act, which defines the youth as 15 to 30 years old. So, um, <laughs> now if you look into the world youth population, you have about 1.2 billion, and this youth population in the world is expected to reach 1.21 billion last uh, in 2010, or about 17.6% of the world's total population. And 90% of these youth are found in developing countries. So you see the dynamics in terms of the presence of very young productive workforce in developing states, as, and uh, you know, the probability for them to actually uh, migrate you know, in terms of development and whatnot. So in this project, we try to sort of uh, intersect these variables, youth bulge, gender, migration, and development. So you can't actually only look into youth bulge per se and population with no, with no uh, intersections with other, with other factors. So as I said in the beginning, this is, a, I would argue, this is a sort of a first pilot study that actually look into the sort of, uh, what you call interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity of the subject. Okay. Um, so I, how many are you here from Asia or have been to Asia? Okay, so uh, um, you have, uh, if you go a wider perspective of Asia, West, uh, the Middle East as we know of now would even be included as West Asia. So my concern would be here in China, India, and the Philippines. So China is the world's most populous country, India the second our most populous country, and the Philippines is uh, number 12, okay? So if you look at the Philippines, it's just a little bit of dots there, some islands, and then you have India there, kind of big, the subcontinent, and China, another big country. So to actually make Philippines as one of the top 12 
country is actually more population is kind of amazing if you look at the, 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 the relative size of the country. Okay. So Asia, as I said, accounts for 50% of the world's youth labor force. And uh, with this, you have 54.1% of the unemployment in, this, in these areas. So over 50% of the population of young people are unemployed. So where would they go if the, do if the domestic economy cannot absorb um, you know, this young, educated workforce? Okay. And Southeast Asia is one of the highest in this range. Southeast Asia refers to Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and others. So, so this is the Philippines, so by way of context, why, for example, uh, it's kind of distinct in many ways. It's the only predominantly Catholic Christian country in Asia. Uh, of course, a product of uh, <coughs> over nearly 400 years of Spanish colonization. We say that Philippines was, uh, for over 300 years, enclosed in a convent, and then after that came out and joined Hollywood. <laughs> so it's the first colony of the United States from 1899 to 1946. So we are the so-called showcase of democracy of the United States, being the first colony of the United States in Asia. So you have about, um, you have the, it's an archipelago, so you have over 7,000 islands. Now depending whether the country experiences high tide or low tide, some islands disappear. And this is also very important in terms of climate change and geography, since uh, based on, I think, this week's uh, report, the United Nations, some countries are drastically affected by climate change, and the Philippines is one of those. We are in the so-called equatorial belt, and uh, uh, over 20 kinds of typhoon or every um, visit the country, and that's where I came from, Takloban, in Eastern Visayas. Can you see the small that? This small that of 7,000 islands, but only about 3,000 are inhabited. The rest are up for grabs. If you're interested, you can buy one. <laughs> <laughs> now, there are over 180 dialects. Uh, there are eight major dialects. So how do we understand each other? Okay, I come from Visayas. I have a different dialect. But uh, well, so maybe a friend of mine who come from you know, the zone, different dialect. So in school, you're actually taught the national language, the national Filipino language. So um, basically, it's a, English is a second language for business, uh, education. So books are in English, newspapers are in English, and then you have the national language version, the Filipinos. And if you go to different dialects, some of the dialects are, are part of the a local newspaper. So in 2012, population of the Philippines is about uh, Canada would be three times of Canada. Imagine Canada, so huge country, is just about three, th three times less of that for the Philippines. So 96.71 million population. Uh, it's increasing, okay, 2030, 97.70 million population with about 3% growth rate. And uh, plus the, plus the, culture, religion, and Catholicism, where you're not allowed to use condom, except, you know, memorize the dates that you're not supposed to have sex. <laughs> okay, so, however, yeah, the, the Catholic Church only endorses abstinence and, uh, what's that one? Rhythm. Rhythm. Rhythm and withdrawal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, however, you know, this kind of uh, unique qualities or features of the country, it is also the only Asian country in the top 10 of the Gender Parity Index by the World Economic Forum. That means to say that we have sort of closed the sort of bridge the gap closer in terms of the presence of women in education, business, politics, etc., etc. Uh, Philippines is the only one there, only Asian country. Canada, I think, ranks about 20. So <laughs> in terms of Philippines and Canada, gendered. Uh, uh, equity, uh, mainstreaming, is very good on paper. Yeah, very good in terms of, you know, the statistics and whatnot. Uh, however, it's also the only country outside of the Vatican which doesn't allow divorce. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> only legal separation, okay? So you see many of these uh, 
interesting uh, dynamics of the country. Now you have 18.5 million people in the Philippines are young in 2010 and increasing. So 1.2 million of them entering the labor force every year from 2010 to 2040. So would there be an equivalent number of available jobs for, for them to be accommodated in the domestic economy if you have 1.2 million youth entering labor force? Incidentally, there are also many cases where one graduating class in a university are bound for overseas. Like 99%, for example, of a high school graduating class would opt for nursing. So now you have the call centers in the Philippines being manned by nursing graduates because they can't be absorbed by the local healthcare industry. And essentially, they took nursing not simply because they want to work in the Philippines, but actually to provide the pool for the international labor market. Okay, so Australia, Japan, Canada, United States, England, wherever. Okay, so have 1.46 million or 51.51% of the country's total unemployed are young people. If you look into this, it's interesting why there's a gendered flow of youth migration because in the Philippines, only uh, what's this? 36% or 30% of women are in paid labor force. So majority, about 60% are male, male employment. Okay. So you have in one in 20 in 2009, you have 1.4 million overseas Filipino <coughs> worker, what also called the new heroes of the country because of the contribution to the do domestic economy by way of the remittances. And majority of this outflow are women, 62% of annual deployment. So more women are leaving the country. More men are staying in the country and getting the jobs. Okay. So <coughs> for now, we have about over 8 million documented Filipinos worldwide, the global labor diaspora. But if you look into the undocumented Filipino migration, it's uh, twice as that. And in statistics, it's kind of hard to, to try to um, monitor and regula regulate. They could, they could regulate how many would leave the country. But once they leave the country as an OFW, no way that they have a way of tracking down where you came from. For example, in Canada, many of the living caregivers or other foreign workers are not sourced directly from the Philippines. Those are Filipinos already sourced out in the Middle East, in London, in the US, and whatnot. So these are coming from third country. Okay? So third country sourced out into Canada, for example. So in terms of sex ratio, this is more or less uh, idea, so you have 100 females for 102 males. If you look at this ratio later on to India, you'll know that there is a distinct um, sex, sex ratio for India's population. Okay? So there is a link there for the census government content. So I don't know. let's see if this works. Anyway, it's not going. So if you're interested, <laughs> there is the latest census published by the Census of the Government of the Philippines on age sex structure of the Philippine population. Okay. Oh. Can you hear my voice? So this is the sex ratio of the population, recent 2010 census. You have more or less uh, kind of ideal view. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now you have, I have to stay here? Oh, you're fine. Oh, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. I tend to move around. She is the, the, the sound. microphone there. It's fine. Okay, so you have all ages, 102 males, 200 females. And you have that. So if you look into the older population, you have more older women and younger you know, tendency of less of men, for example. Now, this might be of interest since many of the women are living in the country. So there's also a way in terms of who will be actually part of the health care service or support caregiving in the later population when many of the women are living in the country. Um, this is India. 
So you have uh, 1.27 billion population last year, and uh, it's the second most populous country. By 2050, it's projected to increase to 1.6 billion, and surpassing China as the number one most populous country in the world. So uh, by that time, because of the targeted zero population growth for China, and rising middle class and you know other programs actually curb fertility, it will now be India's turn to become number one in the country. So for about the same time that they were under British rule, same time Philippines under um, various rule, Spanish and the United States, you have India also under British rule from 1850 to 1947. Okay. This has implication in terms of looking into development programs of a post-colonial state like Philippines and, in, and India, for example. So in terms of population, it's interesting that India only started disaggregating its population statistics by gender in 2001. Okay, so there are 52 <coughs> males and 48% females in the population. So 40% were between those ages, 13 to 35, 90% between 15 to 24 years old. And in 2007, India recorded the largest number of youth in the world. Uh, by 2021, it would reach to 464 million for ages 15 to 34 years old. Now, by 2050, those 25 to 59 years old will comprise half of the population in India. Now, we're looking at the population, the youth bulge in Asia, but this sort of statistics and, and, and facts actually doesn't compare with what's going on in Africa as well. So as you say, it's double population. It's actually in the same rate or even more in African countries. So to look into the, you know, the, the diversity and I think the implications for global youth bulge, for example, in developing countries, including Africa, this has, I think, a lot of implications for uh, development assistance, projects to these different countries. So by geography, 35% um, of 15 to 32 years old are in urban areas and about 32% in rural areas. Different in terms of the population statistics in India is the class. The class is a marker, a distinct marker for the youth population. So those students, the middle class, come from intermediate caste, which is reflective of the caste system in India. Uh, working class students mainly come from the scheduled caste, okay? So in other words, those who have ability to access to education in India belong to the middle class, upper middle class. And you have in a pool, a, a, huge, a huge pool for um, young people who have no access to education or basic, uh, or can finish basic education, okay? Another is in terms of gender imbalance. So if you look into India and Philippines, for example, what I'm trying to say is that here in India, you have a gender imbalance. About 30 states even have alarming sex ratio. Sort of really alarming why there are very, sort of very uh, big gap between the number of females and the number of males in the population. And this also occurs in major states like big states like, like Andhra Pradesh or Punjab, uh, Gujarat, Haryana, Delhi, for example. So if in these cases, you have 870 females for every 1,000 males. So a difference of two or three is fine in the population. And uh, I think uh, there was a study conducted in Harvard some time ago that every, that we are missing like a million girls in the population because of some, because of gendered, um, the valuing of girls, you know, and, and baby, and baby, female babies in, a, in some particular uh, community. So this is an example of a gender imbalance in the <coughs> population. It's also an implication in terms of development and projects and migration and whatnot in these areas. So what were the methods of our s research? So we did a pilot youth survey in the Philippines. So one pilot area is in Metro Manila uh, with the Quezon City Science High School. And the other pilot area was in Baguio City, about 250 kilometers north of Metro Manila. So you have a Metro Manila, but they're all, but they're all kind of urban center. 
The other one, the other pilot school was science-based. The other school was regular based. So we're trying to see whether the choice of education, you know, the choice of education, it, it contributes to their, to their uh, goal to leave the country. Okay, so in other words, the choice for getting a, for entering into a course in engineering or nursing or whatnot is really attuned to leaving the country or simply by their own interest to be a nurse or to be an engineer or whatnot. So, in high, so these are high, high school students. So we use national statistics and data from these countries. And um, I did the key interviews with government officials in the Philippines. So interviewing the officials from education, employment, and the Philippine Overseas and Employment Administration. The other one was the Department of Labor. So trying to see whether you know, there's some sort of a, of a connection between uh, productivity, between um, harnessing youth potential to be absorbed by the domestic economy <coughs> as opposed to, you know, like a pool for international migration. Um, what were our theoretical <laughs> premises for the study? So there are a number of those since uh, uh, Dr. Mendoza was, is an economist and a statistician. Uh, Dr. Caparas was an educational specialist. I am a women and gender studies thing. So trying to put the three together, working on a project overseas is also a challenge. But in a way, we are able to build some sort of commonalities in how we look at this. So and I, I think it's, it's important to realize that when you look into migration, migration is a very complex reality. It can't only be seen and understood by only one aspect. You can't only do that in terms of economics, and you leave out culture. You can also uh, study migration by looking into the values perspective is, itself, but rather to understand the whole dynamics, it has to be you know, interrelated with various theories and principles. So what we look at is that the existing data on the youth balls really is, uh, um, I think, uh, negative in a way that when you speak about youth balls in terms of newspaper articles, popular discourse, is that it's, it, it's applied to youth to conflict, to instability. When there's actually a push in population pressure, it creates instability to the community. So one example is the Arab Spring. So, I know, so I'm saying to my students that, you know, in any history, many of those, um, all of those social movements are actually born, you know, underwritten by young people. The Arab Spring is not an exception if you look into history. Okay, many of the leaders, for example, of independence movement in different countries are led by young people. Okay, like Gandhi in my country, Jose Rizal, they're also young people, under 35 years old. But to say that, you know, because there is a lack of possibility for them to be productive, not doing anything, you know, they, you know, they become rowdy and all of this. So it's really a, a reflection of how we actually, in the West, look at the youth balls, particularly in the Middle East, as uh, related to terrorism and, and others. But essentially, it is a, a different way of looking into the youth balls of uh, various correlations, okay? So I think I mentioned about that. So in terms of development, what we look into is the varied applications of development in most studies, development is related to economic growth, to gross um, domestic product and other measurements of economic uh, achievement. They, there's very, there are very few of those studies that actually include the human capital index, human development, including education, um, healthcare, and whatnot. So I, I think now you have the human development index, and based on the, um, this index, Philippines is kind of below the mark in terms of achieving that as well as India, for example. So we have here um, various aspects of looking into migration and youth, uh, youth balls in India and the Philippines in terms of the employment model for economic growth and the implications of education and development into migration. And of course, now you have the new growth theory and economics that also underscores human capital, say education, and even networks. So essentially what we're trying to hear is that any kind of sort of migration propensity for young people is tied to education and the labor market. Now, what we also look into are the studies on brain drain effects, as well as the brain game effects. So in here, I think you know that well, a highly, highly educated force living in the country would actually deplete the resources of the country for uh, human resource and others. Am I too fast? 
<laughs> so now, <coughs> the other is on the brown drain effects. We're talking about young people. So basically, they have the strength, you know, they could be used as workers in factories. So this is uh, what we call um, one of the one of the areas of study that's not only in terms of the depletion of intellectual capital in the country, doctors live in the country, nurses live in the country, but also young people because they could provide the backbone for construction work, uh, other physically demanding job in many of these countries demanding their labor. So those are the sort of various theories and intersections we try to look into to explain, you know, youth bonds and relations to gender and migration development. We have here what we call calculus of migration, that when one leaves the country, it is uh, under economic theory of migration, the decision to leave the country is based on the net returns, the net economic gains from staying or leaving the country. So is it worthwhile if I leave the country or if I stay in the country? So if I am a nurse, if I stay here in the country, how much would I get as a, as a nurse in the Philippines? So maybe if I go to Singapore, or to Australia or to Hong Kong, even though I'm a nurse in the Philippines, I could be a domestic worker in Hong Kong, I would still be paying more. So in terms of the net returns of migration, the push for migration based on this is higher for many Filipinos. This is also complicated by the personal and socioeconomic dimensions in, in the migrants' families and the host country and the home country, and also the so-called pool factors or characteristics and conditions of the host country, okay? Uh, for example, the, the Living Caregiver Program in Canada, for example, the push is that the very attractive portion of that program is the offer of citizenship. So you can work under living conditions and I promise you citizenship after living in for 24 months of your work in Canada, okay? Now, migration decisions is also influenced by relative level of financial and social deprivation of the family or the individual in two countries. So we say that if there's an expansion of employment, so of employment opportunities for people, for young people in the country, they would not likely leave the area, you know, the country. Or if they have access to, let's say, uh, education, better opportunities to maintain their income in the country, they would not leave you know, the, the community. There are also what we call pecuniary and psychic cost of migration, and these are all used to be that it is only looking into the economic factors, but as well now, it's more of, a, uh, I think, broader in a way of looking into the psychological cost of living in a country. And uh, in terms of evaluating economic costs and psychological costs, many of the women who leave the country in the Philippines, for example, uh, sacrifice the psychological cost of leaving the family behind over the economic cost of migration, okay? because the economic cost of migration far provides some sort of collective good for the family as opposed to the uh, yeah, psychological cost. For example, I argue that when somebody leaves the country, uh, that, that person becomes the, becomes the mobile social support system okay, for, health, for health, health insurance, for education. Because, one, because when one is out in the country, whatever happens to the family back home in the Philippines or in India, the one outside the country provides for the support for health, education, and whatnot. It's different from what we have here in Canada, where it's supposed to be expected government support for health, uh, health and welfare of the people. There, everything is on, um, everything is out, is out of pocket, okay, in a way. Very little support for health health insurance in these cases. But the other important aspect to consider in terms of looking to calculus of migration, now they've already um, accepted or recognized that there's also agency in each and every migrant. Okay, you know that a migrant is a, is a social creature who also desires better outcomes for herself, herself, or family. So it used to be this sort of uh, equation in, the, in understanding of migration is out of the picture. But however, now, it's more on the choice, for example, of if I'm in India, or if I'm in the Philippines, my choice to go to the United States, my choice to go to Canada, my choice to go to Australia, is simply born on the economics, but rather other, okay? Other aspects are actually better in looking into the net returns of migration, okay? Now, in, in our project, one of, I think, 
one of our main understanding, common understanding, was that human mobility equates human development. Okay? Migration is a fact of life. Migration, the ability to move, you know, to travel, you know, to, to go from place to place, is a human right. However, in a very complicated world, okay, where one is denied mobility, it's, it also speaks about the denial and the opportunities for betterment. So we argue that human mobility equates human development. Okay? And uh, migration from a developing country to a developed country is born by the intrinsic values of education. Okay? So what are these? Uh, gains, income gains. If you are a doctor, there's what we call the income gains of you know, lessening your, your profession by becoming a medical assistant or a laboratory assistant. Okay? For example, in Canada, doctors will be able to practice as a doctor because they have to go through this uh, rigorous uh, requalification, licensing, and whatnot. Okay, they could forgo being a doctor and they could become you know, a laboratory assistant, you said. Or, you know, a PhD <laughs> famous for becoming a taxi driver here in the Philippines, in Canada. Okay, what they call intergenerational income gains, okay, in both sending and receiving country. If one is out outside the country, you also have people benefiting from the income gain, even though they are left behind in the country. So you provide better opportunities for them, for education in the country, in, in the home country, okay? So you are, you are here, you're an engineer in Canada or in the US, however, your income is actually provide some sort of a collective in investment for the family back home, okay? By you know, pursuing education and others for the people in the family, by providing support to the family, and ensuring that they're also healthy in many ways. The acquisition of social technical skills for them, okay, like, uh, in the pilot survey, you'll find it later on in my other slides, that uh, although you have finished an education, when the decision to migrate is conscious, the ability to actually work from below up is there, is embedded in the realization of migration, okay? So there are also many ways in, in which they actually develop and acquire skills once they migrate, okay? Or continue, probably, you, you may be exposed to some sort of Okay, how many minutes? Oh, okay. okay, so uh, anyway, so you, you do develop social technical skills and as well participation, civic participation, engagement, whatnot. So however you define it. In terms of class, because when you when you when you leave the country, for example, both India and the Philippines, depending on class, it's more like a marriage, hypergamy, you know. You go up the ladder, you know, you go up to the so there's an imbued the increase of social class in terms of the movement of, of that one, of that migrant, okay. So in terms of youth migration, it's fostered by global, local structures, uh, national relations of the country. For India, you have there a, a, for a British, uh, member of the British Commonwealth, Philippines, uh, calling the United States. So you have, uh, in many ways, the structures embedded in there um, in, in allowing really in allowing the exit you know, and entry of Filipinos to these different uh, uh, areas in the world. You also have a social, cultural, gender factors. One of the values is that if, uh, a, if a community or a state does provide some sort of inhibitions for a female to migrate, then women would likely migrate. But in a community where the value of women living the, the place is looked down, then women would actually be less likely to migrate. So if you look into, um, as, a, as an example, many Muslim communities would, act, would have some sort of inhibitions for women to live, uh, to live by themselves, to be free. Whereas, for example, in, in, in the Philippine context, there is uh, no cultural inhibitions for women living, uh, living in the community. Okay? In fact, uh, they're expected to live and you know, be productive outside, you know, sell the goods outside and then come back, help their family. Okay? One of the basic basis for which we look into my successful migration is the match between your education and the demands of the international labor market. So as I said earlier, migration decisions is made earlier in life. And the choice for the education is embedded in the choice, in the likelihood to migrate. And this is also relative to the choices that you have available in the community and the networks available outside of the community. Okay, so social networks, 
is social network theory is also important in understanding migration, especially youth migration. So this is the pilot survey in the Philippines, the qualitative study, a quantitative study, uh, led by Dr. Ronald Mendoza and Dr. Yang and Professor Navarro in, in the Philippines. So they have about 279 sample population of high school students. And they examine the influence of migration factors, family background, prospects for migration, networks, on students' choices on higher education. So it's all they are graduating students, high, fourth year high school students, and what they would like to take up when they go to, on college or university. So whether the choices is affected by migration decision, okay? And yeah, whether the choice of a degree or a specialization <coughs> maximizes the chances of employment or uh, prospective migration decisions influenced by networks, including their family. Okay. So this is the result. 35% uh, of the total sample indicated intention to migrate after university. This is slightly higher for females, for among female students. Over 70% chose degrees tied to employment opportunities in the Philippines. Okay. And over 60% of total sample indicated employment opportunities as a factor uh, for living outside the country. So the choice is slightly higher for women. So more female students um, look up to employment opportunities abroad as the primary consideration for taking a course in university. Okay? So 82% of females also indicated preference to study abroad, okay? to undertake graduate uh, studies. And this also this correlates with the uh, those students who come from well-educated parents who are more likely to proceed with uh, gen, uh, graduate studies. Here, in terms of choices, engineering is number one, and then accountancy, business economics, communication information technology is more popular, universally popular, compared to the sciences, hard sciences like biology, chemistry, and whatnot. So this, this has a very uh, grave implication to modernization prospects of the country when you have very few uh, students enrolling in sciences. Okay. Uh, as well, enrolling in sciences is also, um, also includes money. Like, uh, as opposed to Canada here, uh, more than 50% of universities in the Philippines are privately owned. So, and uh, uh, public or state universities have very, very competitive examinations. And uh, if, you, if you still want to pursue education, your next option is really to go to a private university. And many of these families, for be able to provide the education, has to leave the country to meet up with the demand for university education. Okay. Um, preferen preference for countries, US and Canada are the top. So why the choice of United States and <coughs> So these are the preferred destinations of high school students in the Philippines. So you have U.S. and Canada top two, okay? And uh, the choices, you know, simply because it's, you know, Canada is a cold country, but rather of the existing relations networks between Canada and the Philippines. So you have over, how many, nearly a million Filipinos in Canada, including the temporary foreign workers, and then this is the, the influence of the choice for destination country is family or the social network. Over 60% of them have indicated having families in either US or Canada. So there is a link already. So chain migration, you know, is, is uh, embedded into the idea of leaving the country once my time comes. So 48% of females were encouraged by relatives to migrate abroad. So the relative, the networks out in the country, you know, push them to actually get this course so that this course will enable you to leave the country. Okay. Now reasons for wanting to migrate, of course, 70% uh, employment opportunities and uh, not surprisingly, including myself, and happiness with the Philippine government. <laughs> 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 okay, 40%. Okay, desire to be independent at 33%. Okay. I hope this will be good. <laughs> okay, now the study of the pilot, the results of the pilot survey actually, um, I think coincides as well with the National Youth Assessment Report in 2010. 
This was done by the National Youth Commission in the Philippines. A third, one third of unemployed youth prefers to work abroad, and 60% of the 8 to 24 years old are more likely to work abroad, to want to work abroad, and higher pay as key reason for deciding to work abroad, and 80% because there are limited work opportunities in the country. So if you produce 100,000 students in engineering, there is no equivalent 100,000 jobs for engineering. So this uh, courses in engineering accountancy enables them to work baseline when they leave the country. I need to say they use education and uh, being an engineer to work themselves up. So they start entry level jobs, whether they're in Middle East, uh, Canada, or whatnot. Okay, so you have, it's not surprising here in Alberta, for example, we have vets, or we have engineers, or we have this working in Tim Horton. It's actually equivalent just for high school, you know, high school level. So in other way, if you look into the brain drain, uh, these young people are actually very productive, also highly educated, highly qualified. They would not become the ready workforce in Canada or United States, thereby um, reducing the investment of US and Canada into the young people to work in a particular place, work in a particular occupation, can you follow? Mm -hmm. So in other words, when they actually migrate to US or Canada, it's a bonus, a big bonus for these countries because they already, they've, they've been, their investment in human capital is borne by a developing country. So the, now in the Philippines, for example, uh, elementary high school education is free. So it's uh, people's, you know, it's government money, people's money. However, the investment for them to be able to be, to be educated is not, uh, uh, let's say, embraced or not uh, used by the domestic economy because they, have, they leave the country, it's now to the benefit of Canada, US, Australia, and whatnot, okay? So, okay. Observations, of course, in our study, we based on India, China, and the Philippines, although I presented only India, India and the Philippines, there is a gender bias in future migration. More females, more young, more young women, have a tendency or propensity to leave the country, okay? They're, they, even though you know, they understand about these diversities of uh, expectations, they have a realization of working abroad by working way out. The interest of young people to equip themselves with education preparation to working abroad is equivalent to a complete package of brain and brawn, okay? So the brain of educated population plus their physical ability to work in this, uh, in the, so lag in science courses, implications for industrialization prospects in the Philippines. So there's a study that says that it would take Philippines 100 years to actually be at par with Canada in terms of basic services, provision of education, you know, like universal with multiple access to healthcare and whatnot. Okay, so education and development in the Philippines, you have here, uh, last year, Philippines introduced a new educational system. It's now K-12, K-12. So prior to 2013, it's only up to four years, six years in elementary, four years in high school, four years in university, so something like up to 10 years, not 12 years of uh, basic education. So they changed that last year. So for the first time, the three, the tripartite partnership for commission on higher education, department of education, et cetera, this, by integrating vocational, and, uh, vocational courses and traditional courses into the, into the population, uh, what they call education curriculum, okay? Uh, in terms of India and Philippines, for example, Philippines has, uh, has a high female literacy rate, distinct from the rest of the developing world. Whereas in India, uh, female literacy rate is much lower than the boys, the male literacy rate. And this has uh, a number of implications. If you look into the investment for education in India at only 3% of GDP. So uh, also in India, it's only in 2009 where they make it compulsory basic education. So these are the um, reali realization for public expansion education and then boosting the uh, productivity of the young population to put it into the economy. Okay, so international implications. What does it mean for us, you know? What's important? Okay, so in 2015, the 
the UK government announced a uh, cut to the development assistance to uh, India because that is already an emerging economy. Uh, their annual aid is only 3% for education. Okay, Canada, CEDA, CEDA and the Philippines has a very long partnership, but uh, recently under Harper government, CEDA was dismantled. It's now under the so-called foreign affairs, trade and development. So youth bonds in developing countries, gray population in uh, Western developed countries. So there's now what they call international labor brokering for who gets the best talent in the world. So something like, uh, uh, Countries with selected immigration policies like Canada, Australia, and the United States cherry picks from the youth, uh, educated youth force to be part of their own society. Okay, and uh, this ensures that those who are highly educated um, enters the country, and also education is crucial in their migration intentions in the end. So it ties with education, migration, as well as you know who is likely to leave the country. There's a gendered phase in terms of leaving the country. So I will have to leave it at that and open the floor for questions. Thank you.